Hello, everyone. I am Durgesh, and I welcome you to the next episode of the Enlightening Talk series under the campaign We Leap. And today I am extremely excited to have Professor Julie Shah. She is a professor at the MIT Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and she leads the interactive robotics group of the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory. Uh, she has obtained her bachelor's, master's, and PhD, all from the Aerospace Engineering Department at MIT. And uh, before joining as a faculty, she worked at Boeing uh, Research and Technologies, uh, working on the robotics uh, for the aerospace applications. And uh, uh, she, um, Professor Shah also has a lot of awards in her bag. So just to name a few, she is recognized with NSF's Career Award for her work on the human aware autonomy for team-oriented environments. And was also uh, she was also recognized by the MIT Technology Review, uh, being one of the world's top innovators under the age of 35. And her work on the uh, industrial human robot collaboration is recognized by the technology review as one of the 10 uh, breakthrough technologies of 2013. So, and she holds, obviously, she holds international recognition in her field. So, I'm extremely excited to hear more from her and learn from her journey and experience. So, without any further ado, let's welcome Professor Julie Shah. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so uh, I am I'm very hopeful that a lot of uh, graduate students and women aspiring for the faculty career and long-term research career will benefit from this conversation. So let's get into this. So I will start with the first very basic question. Uh, what was your inspiration to get into the aerospace field? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for that question. Um, it's been a long time since I've been asked that question, I think. But I'm one of the I'm one of the people that I, I feel as though I was almost born just wanting to do aerospace in some way or another. Um, so um, as far back as I can remember, I really loved airplanes and rocket ships. Um, and uh and I wanted to know, you know, I wanted to be an astronaut and go into space. And then whenever I'd ask someone, what do I need to do to, you know, uh, build things that go into space or be an astronaut, they'd say, well, you need to be really good at math and science, um, which I think is not the party line anymore. I think now the party line is you need to be good at everything, <laughs> which is really more true. <laughs> um, you know, more, more than just math and science really matters, um, clearly. Uh, but, um, yeah, no, as, as far back as I can remember, um, and was, you know, delighted as an, as, uh, a high schooler to, to get into MIT. And, um, you know, as you noted in my bio, uh, I, I, I came to MIT at the age of 18 and I have never left other than a year out of Boeing and then a year at Harvard at the Radcliffe, um, Institute along the way. But, um, uh, in the aerospace department, uh, really doing what is, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the best dream job I could possibly imagine. Yeah, that's the charm of MIT. Once you are here, you are hooked for life. <laughs> that's good that we have you. So I also wanted to know a little bit about your familiarity, uh, like in your family, how much aware were people about STEM education and did you receive support when you were growing up and thinking about your career maybe? Or even just high school. Yeah, no, I would, I would, I was very fortunate in that way. So um, both my my parents, my mom and my dad, um, had graduate degrees. My mom an MBA, um, and my dad um, a PhD in in computer science. Back when computer science was a field that I think was only a few years old. <laughs> Um, and um, I lived in New Jersey. My dad worked at Bell Labs, which became AT and T, which became uh, Lucent, and uh, uh, and was encouraged in STEM from from a very young age. So I remember, you know, for Christmas I'd get like I think back on it, and I thought it was super awesome. But like um, one of my presents one year when I was pretty little was like a satellite imagery kit where there were like satellite images, and then you could take you know a magnifying glass or microscope and kind of look at the at the images, and that kept me occupied for I don't know I don't know how long. 
So um, I was, uh, you know, very, very much encouraged in my interests um, in STEM growing up. Wow, that's wonderful. So that makes me think that maybe you had a very good idea of what you want to be become, uh, even in early age, like, did you have any career vision when you were doing high school? Um, so, I, you know, I think I always wanted to do aerospace, I knew that much. But um, I remember when I was in high school, and people say, Oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And, and, and I'd say, Oh, I, I want to study aerospace engineering. Um, everybody would say, well, that is so specific. And I'd be like, yeah, I guess it is really specific, but I think I, I want to do that. And then I remember I came to MIT into the Aero Astro department as a sophomore when I entered the major. Um, and then, and then, you know, people would start out, faculty would start asking, so, so what area are you especially interested in? And I'd be like aerospace. And they'd be like, but what in aerospace? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? I have to specialize further. I thought it was already very specialized. And um, one of the, you know, one of the things that I loved learning was that, uh, you know, how really broad and versatile a degree in aerospace is and, you know, all of the different directions that you can, you can pursue from that is um, as the foundation. Uh, and within, you know, um, as an undergrad, I really love controls. Um, and then, um, I became, I remember in the, you know, like linear control theory class, uh, you know, learning about an autopilot system. And then I remember being kind of really enamored with that. I'm like, well, if you can get, you know, an aircraft to do that on its own, um, like, you know, what's the next level? Um, and then I became interested in kind of like task level autonomy um, and artificial intelligence. And um, as a journey along the way, um, I did my master's degree in what was then called the Man Vehicle Lab. It's now called the Human Systems Lab in Aero Astro. Mm -hmm. And um, and really, um, really gained an appreciation for, you know, when you're when you're developing technology, uh, you know, for complex systems and aerospace and, and, and other settings, really the importance of designing it to fit with human capability. So the way you design, you know, an autopilot fits with, you know, what you know about the knowledge of the aircraft, but also what you know about a human's role in affecting control over that, over that system at, at various levels of, um, of automation. Uh, and that that's really what inspired me to pursue task level autonomy, artificial intelligence, and then um, pursue my area of research, which is in developing AI and computation that is capable of modeling people to facilitate more effective collaboration between humans and machines. Mm -hmm. Okay, so doing this work, uh, were you more clear about that you want to be a professor or do you want to go to industry and make impact there? And then how, like, what were the factors which, you know, decided your future direction? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I never, I never, I never, uh, until very late, never even thought about applying for faculty positions, uh, to be honest. And even when I was applying for faculty positions, I was also applying broadly. I was um, exploring opportunities at, at NASA. That was actually always my dream. I always wanted to go and, and be a civil servant um, at NASA. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, so, um, but, um, you know, along the way, I encourage all of my grad students to TA at some point. Um, I was not, an, I was not a person I think of now as, you know, being the first person you'd select to TA a class. I, I was very quiet, I was very shy, did not like presenting in front of the class. Um, and, um, and two faculty, when I was um, a brand new grad student asked me if I would TA that undergrad controls class. <laughs> and I thought, oh, okay, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll TA class, that'll be a challenge for me. And um, as a part of that, I would give recitations. And I was so nervous about giving those recitations that I would, Actually, before I gave a recitation, I would take my Europs that I was working with in research and I would practice that whole recitation for them, those poor Europs every week. They would sit through my practice run through of my recitation. Um, and um, so it was a challenge for me, but I, I really, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I really enjoyed teaching because it was very tangible, like, like what is accomplished, whereas in research, it's not, you know, the timelines are long and it's not clear, you know, what the points of feedback are necessarily. And you get the sort of immediate, um, you know, gratification in a way of like conveying information and seeing that someone, you know, is learning something, something new. And it's because I enjoyed that experience teaching so much 
I remember um, having a thought one day, I was like, hmm, you know, teaching is really fun. And I remember I looked up at the two faculty, because they would, the two faculty that taught the course, John Dice and Karen Wilcox, they would always come to my recitations. And I remember like looking up at them while I was giving recitation one day and being like, what is it that they do? <laughs> what is their job? Um, and then I started asking, you know, uh, you know, a few more questions about, you know, the faculty route um, and, uh, and um, re really was really enjoying research in, in graduate school um, and uh, made a decision along the way that um, not only would I apply for faculty positions, but um, that might be my first choice. You know, if I, if I got a faculty position, even over the others, um, that might be something that, you know, might really be uh, the best fit for me. Um, but I also, you know, when I started asking my PhD advisor and other mentors, you know, what, what, what would they think if I, you know, applied for faculty positions? Um, I was uh, fairly sure I was going to be told, like, you know, it's really competitive. You might want to you know, look for for other other opportunities, but I was encouraged. I was, you know, so you you know, you make sure you you know you need to publish, you need to do the highest quality you know research that you can do, um, and then um, and then do apply. And so, um, you know, when I went to, I've had a really wonderful set of mentors over the years, and when I went and asked them questions about that career option, they kind of nurtured that interest, you know, I think at, at just the right time. And it's something that I slowly uh, came to, you know, be, be more and more excited about and then now see as, you know, the ultimate dream job. <laughs> That's wonderful. So yeah, it seems like uh, during your PhD was the time when you really realized that you want to be a professor. So, but also when you started just your research project, you know, initially first one or two years are the kind of worst in the way, like defining the problem and finding the uh, ultimate solution to at least attempt on solving that. So how was that? And were there any major struggles during the PhD program? And did it motivate you further? Or did you ever think that, oh, it seems too tough and maybe I should just go to industry? So how was that? I'm asking this because, you know, many of graduate students face this and think yep. this. Yes. What yeah, you? That, you know, that early, that early phase is really challenging. Like what, you know, that, that problem definition phase. And I think everybody through the PhD, almost everybody, I think, encounters it eventually. Um, but some people will encounter it very early if they're given a more open, you know, research project. Others can kind of, maybe they come on a very well-defined research problem and then they, you know, make progress on it. But at some point, you know, one of the key, um, one of the key purposes of the PhD is also to train you in that um, sort of problem, um, you know, formulation skill. Um, and I remember, um, I, 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 you know, I still have that feeling like with research in the lab, like that, like unsettled, like, is this, you know, is this a worthwhile problem? Is this solvable? Is it like too big? You know, like there's like, but the, uh, the, you know, the start of grad work, whenever you encounter that, I, I remember that feeling really, really well. And it did not feel good. Now it's a recognizable feeling to me. I'm like, ah, oh, I think I'm onto something. <laughs> um, but back then it did not feel like a good feeling. And, um, uh, one of the, uh, one of the researchers that I worked with, um, I didn't, I don't think I particularly complained, but I, I think he could just tell I was, you know, swimming around trying to formulate something and was not quite locking in yet. And I remember him saying to me, um, that it doesn't feel like it, but, uh, the, but the phase of the research that I'm in is the most exciting phase. Um, and then you think that, you know, what you really want is to know what you're doing and you come in and you just get it done. But almost like once you get to that phase and, you know, you know what needs to be done and you're just like chugging away at it, you kind of miss that early phase <laughs> where everything was kind of unformed and, you know, it was exploration and it was kind of creative and it was, um, uh, and, you know, he was right. So I've thought about that many, many times since. Um, it doesn't like feel good when you're in it, but a little further on, you kind of miss it. Um, but then the uh, nice thing about doing research is like you kind of, you, you go through that process again and again and again, and it becomes like a recognizable process to you. And I think that definitely makes it easier and more fun in future iterations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very useful to know that we all go through that and we can still, you know, have a successful career like you. Oh, yes, definitely. <laughs> <Very interesting. laughs> 
So how was the experience at Boeing and uh, what, uh, what traits are you developed there which were useful for your professorship career? Yeah, so I applied for faculty positions um, while I was still a grad student. So, um, and I guess, as you know, I did all my graduate degrees here in MIT um, in the Aero Astro Department. And uh, I was very fortunate to be given an offer, um, you know, even applying so early without, without a postdoc. Um, but that offer was um, somewhat contingent on me spending a year elsewhere to be able to, um, to be able to uh, have some new experiences, be able to get, gain sort of a wider view of you know, uh, important and, and interesting problems in the field, um, and to be able to kind of take that back uh, with me when I started on the faculty. So I spent that year working out at Boeing, uh, in Boeing Research and Technology, and I was working on robotics uh, for manufacturing for assembly of, of large commercial aircraft. And it was a really, really amazing experience. And I think it was it was very formative for me um, uh, in terms of um, uh, providing um, sort of the inspiration and direction for the work that that I did when I joined the faculty. So I um, my PhD was um, much like my research area now. My my, my PhD was in um, in human machine collaboration and in developing robotic systems that could uh, collaborate more dynamically with people. And I focused on um, uh, resource allocation or task allocation and scheduling challenges. Um, and so you think about a person doing some tasks in, in a job and a robot doing some tasks, like one of the key challenges to making that work is that people are not robots and they don't do things exactly the same way and they don't do things exactly on the same time schedule. Um, and uh, the robot needs to be able to quickly adapt its plan in response to that variability and that disturbance. Um, and um, uh, out at Boeing, I saw, you know, I really understood for the first time, like the, uh, the potential application and uh, impact that, you know, uh, the, like um, work in that vein could have in a real application. I got to learn about like the business case for the introduction of new technologies. Um, and I got to learn a whole lot about actually at, like how aircraft are built, like on the shop floor, which was super, super fun. <laughs> Um, and I came back and, you know, uh, I'd say even now, probably half of my research portfolio is in robotics for manufacturing. And it was not an application area that, that I studied deeply as a part of my PhD. So in, in many ways, it was a very formative experience um, for the research that I've done since. Mm -hmm. uh, and then personally, um, you know, one of the reasons that I uh, had initially thought that maybe a faculty position would be the right job for me was I always tell people I really love teaching so I think you know I think a faculty position is is right for me and uh, my colleagues in industry would point out you know like teaching is a really really important part of success in industry and I'd always be like yeah okay sure thank you um, but then you know out out there I really I really saw what that meant and how how, how important it is being able to teach and train um, and uh, share knowledge in that way that you that brings the same joy and uses the same skill set that that you use for teaching um, in academia. So I kind of put that aside as a reason for you know uh, you know you go you know choosing academia over industry. And so if if that's helpful for anybody, if you love teaching, like that is equally important to your success um, in industry and you have equal opportunity to exercise that, you know, that skill um, in industry as in academia. Okay, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. So um, you discussed a little bit about your work. Uh, would you be, uh, I'm interested that if you can show some of the research projects going on in your lab these days. Uh, yes. So you can talk about it. I'd be happy to. So I can um, I can do it like a, a brief on maybe a short few minute brief on one of the recent projects um, in my lab, um, very much motivated by human robot collaboration in manufacturing, but also relevant to other industries as well. Um, so tell me if this. Yeah, I can see this, but not in full screen. Okay, should I swap displays? Okay. How does that look? Yeah, now now I can see the. Great, person. great, great. 
So, um, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, you know, a recent project um, we developed in the lab um, aimed at this um, aimed at this goal of making machines and robots um, more capable teammates to people. And um, you know, a core, uh, you know, a core vision of, of my lab's work is being intentional about developing um, computing, robotics um, that augments rather than replaces uh, capability. And so I've worked for you know, many years in robotics for manufacturing, as I've mentioned, and in, in that setting, as well as in many other settings, if you look to you know, fulfillment and warehouses, um, you know, but in any other, many other industrial sectors, um, there are many robots out there in the world, um, but they're, you know, they're working in ways that are uh, relatively structured. Um, these are systems that um, are really working independently from people. So they're, they're coexisting rather than really collaborating. In Amazon's warehouses, you have shelves that are robots and they move to human pickers at the edge of the warehouse, uh, but the robots are still working in a space that's largely separate from people. Um, and then on, you know, on, in other factories, like in automotive factories, you see um, these more safe robots, these collaborative robots being deployed. Um, you can remove the cages from them. You can put them right next to people, um, but they're still working kind of, you know, uh, physically next to people, not, not interdependently. Um, and, um, and so I, I want to draw kind of a, a parallel here and also talk about, you know, the, the, um, the limitations of this mode of working with robots in, in a broader sense as well. So, you know, a fun stat that I like to throw out in my talks is there's somewhere, you know, north of 1.8 million industrial robots that are in operation around the world today. Um, and then what I do like in live talks is then, you know, I anchor you with that stat, like 1.8 million. And then I, and then I say, so how many robots would you say are in U.S. homes today? 1.8 million industrial robots around the whole world. How many robots in U.S. homes today? Okay. Now I'm going to put you on the spot. What would you, what, what would you guess? Uh, I have no idea. Maybe 100,000. No, maybe yeah, three. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, so it doesn't matter what audience I ask this question to, whether it's like roboticists or AI researchers or like a broad audience or, you know, like it doesn't matter who, the answers range from about 10,000 <laughs> to like, you know, 10 million. So it turns out it's like 30 million robots in US homes. And those are things that like look like robots, like a Roomba. And it's also not counting, you know, like Alexa's smart home technology. It's not counting service robots in, hosp in you know, hospitals or um, like if anybody's encountered these robots in grocery stores that go up and down the aisles looking for spills. It's not counting, yeah, um, security, you know, guard robots. So we, we actually have a lot of robots around us on, on a daily basis, um, but it definitely doesn't feel like we do. And it's, um, and you know, I'd argue it's because these, much like in the industrial sector, these robots are doing narrowly defined tasks in fairly structured environments and essentially under constant human oversight. So they're pretty limited in the value that they can provide to us. Um, similarly, how they're limited in, in the industrial sector, if you're just gonna put a robot to do a task on its own uh, versus really integrate into a workflow. Uh, much of the you know, interesting and complex work humans do involves uh, complex workflows of you know, multiple people. Um, and so uh, you know, these systems are, are limited in that way. And it's because they don't see us as people. At best, we're like obstacles to them currently. And this is a very, this is a very practical problem. Um, this is a headline from a few years ago now, but there was a, a time where there were so many startups deploying sidewalk delivery robots on the streets of San Francisco. Like, these are big systems and they like the people moving around them are just obstacles to these systems. So imagine coming up to this huge system, um, the elderly and people with disabilities, as well as many others in the city really felt unsafe. And so um, they, you know, went to the city. They said they felt unsafe, and these sy these systems were moved from the most populated areas of the city. And so um, you know, this this challenge of enabling these systems to integrate into our workflows, to be able to model us and see us as more as people than as obstacles, is really fundamental to the the broader use of these technologies, and in particular in the broader use in ways that can enhance human capability uh, versus kind of make all our lives, you know, harder um, in many ways. 
And so my lab works on developing um, the like the capabilities that can like make robots into good teammates. If you'd like take your favorite sports team, whatever that happens to be, <laughs> um, and you think about, you know, what makes, you know, your um, what makes the people on that team, you know, so effective, like people have three, you know, people are able to do three things. Um, that, that make us effective team members. We're able to um, kind of infer what our partner is thinking. We're able to anticipate what they'll do next. And then we're able to make fast adjustments when things don't go according to plan. And um, you know that requires planning, like that requires like sitting around a table, working out the game plan. That requires refining our, our understanding of how it is we work together through experience and practice and training. And then that involves obviously being able to play the game, which is a whole different set of technologies of under, you know, uh, monitoring what's happening around you in real time and then being able to act on that and update the system's plans in real time. And so um, a key part of our research over the last few years has been um, enabling robots to learn uh, more about people from observing us to be able to provide these systems a human model to facilitate more effective collaboration. So we hold all sorts of human, uh, you know, uh, human sort of latent uh, factors that influence our behavior. Uh, we might have particular priorities or preferences for how we do work. Fatigue level might impact how we behave. Um, workload might impact, you know, um, the the way in which we'll accomplish our task. Um, and uh, and so it's a key challenge. Can a system looking at us? learn this behavioral model of a person to be able to collaborate with us more effectively? And how can it learn those aspects that are not directly observable, those latent decision factors? So we, we work on developing inference techniques that, um, spoiler, you, you can't learn those factors just by observation alone, but need some additional kind of input from people. So take time series data of human behavior in some way, and then take other high level information that's easy for people to provide. So, um, you know, simple coding of, you know, when my priority changed in doing this task, not what my priorities were, but like, when did my mental model of how I wanted to do this change, for example, or think of an autonomous uh, vehicle, um, it might have partial dynamics, partial information of the rules of the road, um, moving from one city to another, but other aspects of it, you know, need to be learned, like the way you make a left turn in one city might, the social convention of that might be different in another city. But nonetheless, the rules of the road we do have, can we leverage that as sort of high level input to inference systems? Um, and so what we're able to show is that uh, by developing a constrained variational technique, uh, inference technique to use this high level input, we're able to uh, learn complex models of you know, people or other you know, black box systems um, equally well as if we had full labels of all of the mental states <laughs> that, you know, that mattered to that person's behavior. And unsurprisingly, a system that you know, is not given that additional information can't really recover you know, the true behavioral model of a person or, or, or another system. And so what we do is we uh, enable these systems to learn from relatively few interactions with a person that sort of um, that that um, that model that includes latent states that affect their behavior. It can learn or use a task model that's provided to it, and then we develop computational techniques for the robot that can take as input those human models, those task models, and then generate a robot policy to execute the task with the person online. And so I'll finish up by showing you a demonstration of this in action. We had uh, people come into the lab and work with our robot. First, they taught the robot how they wanted to do a task, which was preparing four stamp sandwiches at a station in whatever order, according to whatever preference they wanted. The robot uh, was providing a supporting action of pouring juice at the appropriate station. And then a person in the robot uh, needed to collaborate to deconflict their work so that they wouldn't interfere in both work at the same station at the same time. In addition, we provided the robot as a part of its planning capability, the ability to plan communications as well to tell the person um, either what the person should do next uh, or to provide updates about uh, what it would do next so the person could use that in their own uh, planning. So you'll see here the robot is tracking the person's motion of their hand. Um, hey teammate, let's make some meals. I will pour juice. Please make and wrap the sandwiches. Let's start. And so here the robot is tracking the person's hand you can see uh, and um, the uh, robot Please is make the next sandwich at two. 
the robot is deciding what to communicate and also its motion through the space, like its trajectory. Um, and it's updating that plan every 0.3 seconds. So you can see there, the robot was very uncertain what the person would do to start. So it just told the person <laughs> what the best thing would be based on its own plan. Um, and the rest of the time, it's holding a very strong belief over where the person's gonna be next. So it's not communicating. And so at this point, you see the person is reaching for station one. The robot didn't even communicate because it had learned a very high quality model of the human and uh, was very confident that it was going to be reaching the station one. And you can see it sweeps in to pour the juice um, at station two right next to the person, showing efficient uh, sharing of space. I am pouring juice at three. In that case, um, it was somewhat uncertain what the person would do next. So an effective teaming behavior would be to tell your partner what you're gonna do so that they can plan around it. Um, actually, the most inefficient teams are the ones that are explicitly uh, commanding each other a lot. So this is an effective uh, teaming behavior. I am pouring juice at four. I am pouring juice at four. And there you can see uh, after the first 0.3 seconds, the robot was still uncertain where the person was gonna reach. So it communicated again. So that gives you a good sense of um, how often in this interaction, the robot uh, is relatively sure of where the person will go next and therefore doesn't I need to communicate. Juice. So this is an example of bringing some of the technologies of our, of our lab together to develop uh, robots that don't need to just sit on the sidelines and wait to be told what to do, but can watch us, learn from input uh, about us, and then jump in to collaborate um, as better teammates. Wow, oh, this is wonderful. It's so, so, so exciting. I like literally it's a breakthrough in technology. So uh, I was just wondering, when did you come up with this idea for the first time? And what was the challenge that people had not done it before? Whether they had not thought about it and were, or there were like technic technological challenges in achieving that and making it a reality. Yeah, this, this, this um, first the vision of developing robots um, that are able to augment rather than replace people has been sort of core to uh, you know, going back to my PhD and, and before. But then, you know, then you have to start asking questions, well, what's necessary to make that possible? And what's interesting is, you know, once, once you start with that as being the goal, like we want this robot to collaborate with us to, um, you know, improve efficiency, improve uh, ergonomics of the, of the work for the person, uh, improve, you know, uh, other dimensions as well, then, um, you know, it's, that's, those are different challenges than if you try to uh, enable or develop a robot to do everything that a human is doing in that task. So uh, for example, it makes easier the challenges of manipulating flexible material or doing other very dexterous tasks, which is still a very hard open challenge in robotics. Like the robot doesn't need to install the cabling or the wiring necessary if, if, if it's collaborating and just doing the tasks it can do um, and interleaving that with the work that's better suited for a person. Um, but on the other hand, um, now you have to solve the integration challenge. Now the robot needs to be smart enough to, um, to know what a person is currently doing, to anticipate what they're going to do next. Um, and that motivates a whole, uh, you know, another set of challenges, like how do you, how do you uh, give the robot that knowledge in a way that's easy for people? Because otherwise you've just you know, shifted from one really hard problem to another without making it uh, something that can be human supported. So, um, you know, we have, um, you know, I, you know, the, that demonstration that I just showed, it, it represents, uh, you know, multiple PhD students worth of progress, um, and work and is still only kind of like one pillar in this sort of multi-pillar, uh, you know, like research and development strategy for making these systems, you know, uh, more capable, more capable partners. Um, but, you know, back to the earlier conversation, like this is the fun, right? Like you take your problem and then you're like, okay, how do I formulate this into something that, that uh, is ambitious, uh, has not been done yet, but like that I can chunk out steps towards uh, building out and, uh, and making possible. And you do that like on some time scale for your PhD in kind of miniature, and then you do that again <laughs> on a larger scale in uh, like running a research program as faculty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. This also tells us that uh, being a professor can be a good career choice if you want to keep pursuing your dreams. 
<laughs> towards higher and higher uh, altitude. <laughs> So, uh, so professor, I wanted to uh, ask about how did you uh, prepare for your faculty applications? And uh, okay, I got some idea of, on how you developed your research vision, but then how did you decide on which colleges to apply and uh, you know how to proceed forward? What were the challenges? Yeah, so um, this is thinking back, uh, it gets longer and longer every time someone asks me. <laughs> Uh, and so I applied for faculty positions, um, you know, 10 or 11 years ago uh, now. And so um, I might share some of the advice I was given and, you know, it evolves over time. Um, but just to know it was, was a, a while ago. Uh, and as I mentioned, you know, I, I uh, became interested in, in applying for faculty positions you know, through my PhD. And even then I wasn't... Um, sure uh, exactly what type of institution would be the right one for me. I really enjoyed teaching. So uh, I, I applied to uh, some primarily undergraduate institutions. Um, I applied to ones that were really strong and, you know, in, in my areas of research, big research institutions. And then um, I remember I was on, I, I went to a panel. I, I tried to make, you know, the best use I could of all of all the resources that, that MIT provided. They, they do these wonderful like work-life balance panels and like preparing for, you know, faculty application panels. And I would go to all of them and kind of take notes about um, length and structure of, you know, the, um, the statements. Um, and I remember someone on one of those panels um, had said, you know, just make sure you apply really broadly. Um, and they gave this stat of like, you know, you can, as a rule of thumb, and who knows if this is true or it translates, I don't even remember, you know, what this person's field was, but they said this to me and always stuck with me. And they were like, well, if you apply to say 20 programs, you might get four interviews and you might get one job offer. So if you'd like to negotiate more than one job offer, you should apply to more than 20 places. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> So I think I applied to, I don't know, 25 or 30 places, you know, so, something like that. I got, you know, a handful of job interviews, you know, uh, not too far off from that person's rule of thumb. Um, and then uh, was fortunate to have like more than one offer to, to negotiate. Um, but I applied very broadly because, um, because of that advice. And I think it worked out really well for me. Um, I, in the interviews, I found really fun and really informative. Because the you know they were interviewing me, but I was also trying to figure out like what what type of job I wanted <laughs> was it you know and it was would that be like the right um, environment for me? Um, and so I interviewed. Yeah, I, I like um, up until the end, I was considering whether to you know go to a big research school or a primarily undergrad uh, institution, and and that was um, a little bit of a, a hard choice, but. Uh, one of the things I, I really loved about MIT was, um, was the value uh, that, that's placed on teaching um, and, um, and the, you know, the, the, the excellence that, that, that many faculty bring uh, to their teaching in addition um, to research. Um, and uh, yeah, and so I, I would, you know, my advice would be along the way, uh, get a lot of feedback from, from different mentors um, I iterated very substantially on my statements with my faculty mentors. I got a lot of feedback um, on them and went back a few times with revisions to see if it was, you know, conveying what I hoped it would convey. I, that was enormously helpful. And then uh, the same thing with interviews, with um, preparing my talks. I, I practiced a lot. I got a lot of feedback from many different, um, many different groups. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's, I, you know, I guess uh, the, the advice I have to offer. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. So um, can you also share your experience as a faculty member at MIT? How were your first couple of years? Were they stressful? Did you, were you receiving support? How was it? Um, they were, I think there's, I think there's, um, I think there's no way for them not to be stressful, but that might just be a personality thing. I bet somewhere there's someone who doesn't find the first few years of faculty stressful. But the reason I found it stressful was because everything was new. I had never written a proposal before I started as faculty. So if you're, you know, a postdoc someplace or you have lots of, you know, experience, you know, uh, writing proposals, then you won't feel what I felt, which was 
staring at a blank uh, Word doc because I wasn't using LaTeX then. It was a Word doc with like the blinking cursor and then thinking to myself, like, what even goes in a proposal? <laughs> um, I remember, you know, I think that's like, it's kind of stressful. Like every time, you, every time, you know, I have to do something that's new that stretches me, um, I feel that way. Um, teaching, you know, giving some lectures or some recitations is very different than delivering an entire course um, yourself. And I mentioned, you know, how much I prepared for my recitations. As faculty, there's no way you can fully practice. Maybe someone else can, but there was no way I could fully practice every lecture before um, I gave it. And so I had to slowly become comfortable with just preparing my notes and assuming I would go and deliver, you know, a good lecture and that it would be on time, you know, like, um, so, you know, that, that was a learning curve, writing proposals, teaching, spinning up research. So, um, uh, in, in, uh, in going through that process again of like formulating your research agenda, um, now you have, it's not just you doing the research, right. But you're, you're bringing on and you're training new grad students and you're trying to align like their interests and their skill set with the directions that you're aiming to take projects and all of that is a new experience. Um, and there's like, you know, like seven other parts to the job and it's, um, uh, it can definitely, it can definitely feel like a lot at times. Um, but it definitely gets easier too, because there's new parts that are added to your job, but you know, those basic ingredients remain the same part of your job. So then you get more and more experience doing it. And now I no longer, uh, now I no longer have that, that feeling of like unknown and dread when I have to write a proposal. I'm like, oh, okay, here we go. Here's, you know, I know what to do. Um, and teaching, you know, it becomes, you know, more and more fun. And, you know, if you get to reteach the same class, that's great. But otherwise, you know, it, it all becomes more familiar. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a lot of new jobs to start for sure. And that's a challenge. Mm. Okay, thanks. Uh, so a well NSF career award and being recogni recognized by MIT Technology Review. These are like one of the biggest accomplishments one can get in science and technology. So, and you have got them. So I was just wondering, like sometimes, you know, uh, common uh, people will think that, okay, this award is too big for me. I can never get it. Maybe the people who get it are like exceptional or they have something special. So, since we have you, <laughs> what what skills or unique uh, actions help you to you know proceed in that direction and being that person who is like actually able to have that award? What would you? Yeah, like? thank thank you so much. Um, so uh, you know, doing doing your best research, research that you're really passionate about, is like the is the is the first thing, and that's the advice that I got. Like, focus on doing the work that you think is really important and is really valuable, and that you can uniquely um, contribute to and accomplish. And so, um, uh, you know, that's that's the first thing. the The second thing is then. Um, uh, you know, just like in applying for faculty positions, like you want to build your network and be able to learn from others and be able to get feedback uh, from others as well. So um, I think the, the, the very first paper I was submitting out of my lab was to a new conference that I had never submitted to before. And so I, um, you know, another faculty kindly offered to kind of like be a reviewer on that early paper and then, you know, gave me great feedback. Um, on it. Um, and similarly for uh, proposals. So um, uh, the um, uh, I was fortunate that other faculty a few years ahead of me had received um, NSF career awards and they offered me their proposals so that I could see what one looked like, right? And I could ask questions about, you know, what are the key elements? Um, because it's a different type of proposal than a typical NSF proposal. Um, and so I, you know, I, I pay that forward. I try to provide people my, my proposals as well so that they can, you know, have that same benefit that I had that was clearly, you know, very, very helpful um, for me. But, you know, doing the research is really important, but communicating effectively about it and, and, um, and marshalling like the resources and support and um, collaborators and mentors to help make you successful. It's a critical job in faculty as it is as a, as a grad student. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Like it takes a lot of skills to, you know, be successful and show to the world what exactly you are. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. So uh, going to the next question, uh, what is the toughest part of being a faculty member? What would you say? 
Yeah, the, the toughest part is is how many jobs it is. <laughs> and it's like the juggling of all the jobs, you know. Um, uh, and another other great advice that I got right when I started on the faculty from, from another faculty uh, mentor was that, you know, maybe for some people, as it was for me, doing your PhD is like a uniprocessing job. Like I just quietly sat at my desk and programmed. Like that's how I did my PhD, right? And then as a faculty, now you have all these jobs to juggle and you have all these students to supervise. And um, uh, and the advice I got was to learn how to juggle as like a separate skill in and of itself. And you need to make sure you don't pay too much attention to any one ball because then the whole thing falls apart. And I juggled in college, so I knew what that meant. <laughs> I like, I, I understand. Like if you, if you pay too much attention, you have to constantly be switching your attention. Otherwise, you know, yeah, the whole thing falls apart. Um, that was a very hard skill for, but, but having, having been told to recognize it as a skill right at the start was very, very helpful for me. Cause then it was like a skill, like all the others that I could work on. And then I did get really good at it. So, um, but that, I think that, that, um, is, uh, I think one of the, the major challenges of the job. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, what is the most satisfying part of this career? We talked about the challenges. So yeah. what gives you the most satisfaction though? Yeah, the, um, the people I work with is the most wonderful part of the job. The, um, the you know, my, my grad student collaborators I learn from every day. And then you also, you know, on the grad side have this, uh, you know, this, this wonderful like experience of like, uh, you know, growing with someone like growing a research project, growing uh, a research program, uh, learning new things um, together. Um, and then I've just, you know, now that I've been doing this a number of years, um, seeing um, kind of like the, their path through my lab where their lives intersected me and then what they go off to do is, um, is really inspiring um, and really, really incredible. And I still love, I still love teaching. Um, and, um, the other really, you know, wonderful thing about this job is like, it's a job where your job is to envision the future and then, and then aim to show that that's possible, right? Like that's, um, it's a really amazing, uh, job to be, to be given. Mm -hmm. I can totally see that. Yeah. <laughs> so wanted to ask, how does your typical work day look like? How do you like juggle all these things? How do you stay motivated every single day? What's your mantra? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I could, I could, I could tell you pre COVID, but in COVID, oh my goodness. So I have, um, I now have a three-year-old and a five-year-old mm -hmm. and when COVID started, they were one in three, right? Like, you know, like one and a half and three and a half. So, um, and, um, so prior, prior to COVID, um, uh, you know, I would, um, uh, I've, I've, I, you know, a lot of help and a lot of support is like, uh, you know, absolutely necessary in, in every facet of your life. Um, but I had, I had much clearer separation, you know, as, as anybody with kids, would under typical circumstances between home and work. I come into my office, I'm super focused, I get my work done, you know, like go home, spend time with my kids and then, you know, do, do uh, whatever needs to be done, you know, when, when, when they're asleep and, you know, obviously you want to spend time with, uh, with, you know, your, your, your significant other as well. So, um, but, you know, with COVID, I think many people will relate to the ways that uh, it's like a whole new juggling act, a whole new juggling act. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. What does a typical work day look like? It's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an uncertain world right now. I'm happy to be in the office today. Last week I was not, who knows tomorrow, um, but we still do great work. So, um, and all the aspects of the job that are still great are still great. Um, and so, uh, I don't know how to answer that question at this moment, unfortunately. <laughs> Yeah, no, I understand. I mean, COVID has changed the way we live. So it's understandable. Um, so then how do you decompress after work and try to, you know, maintain a good work-life balance? Is there a balance? <laughs> How do yeah. You well, with, with very young kids, they, they can be pretty all consuming, um, which is both like, um, it's both really fun and mentally relaxing in some ways, just to like, you know, you know, be on the floor with them and playing with them or doing, you know, a puzzle or a game. Um, and also, you know, um, 
uh, and also challenging in many ways, in many ways too. But uh, little kids are just, you know, all consuming. Um, and now that they are just a little bit older, and now I can leave a room without worrying one of them will choke or stick something into a wall socket. Um, I sometimes find myself like with, with like on a Saturday morning drinking coffee and they're just playing together in the living room. And I'm like, I guess I'll clean the kitchen. So I clean up the kitchen and I'm like, what should I do now? Like, how long will this last? <laughs> and so like, you know, within the last few weeks or maybe a few months, occasionally I will open a book and read for a little while until one of them comes and, you know, wants something. Mm -hmm. um, but I love, love reading. I love reading. That's like in the past. Yeah. Um, that's what I would always do with any, any spare time. Um, and um, in the past, you know, like, you know, my, my husband and I have in the past, like to scuba dive, we like skiing, we like outdoor activities. We do a lot of hiking with our kids um, and our dog uh, over the past two years. A um, lot, lot of outdoor and the activities. Yeah, I think all these additional responsibilities as a mom, as a woman, like they definitely take time out from your what you could have dedicated in the professorship role, right? So does it make it harder a little bit? I guess so, right? And how do you then manage everything? Yeah, well, I definitely became much more efficient when I had kids. Um, and then, um, you know, before maybe sometimes during a work day, if I just wanted like a little bit of like a mental break, I might like pull up the news and like read an article or two <laughs> about what's happening in the world and don't do that anymore, much more focused, but you just kind of, that, that kind of happens naturally. Um, uh, and, um, and then I, I think you also get better about being more thoughtful about like what requires you and then what doesn't necessarily require you or requires a little less of you and will happen and will be perfectly good. Um, and so, um, yeah, um, the, you know, the flexibility of time is very different for sure. Um, but I don't think in, you know, I have super, super, super happy kids. I feel like a super great mom, not every day, but almost every day. Um, and you know, our, my lab is, you know, a super happy and productive lab. And so all of that is wonderful. Um, I think travel was, travel was the one thing that was like harder for me when I had little babies. Cause I just didn't want to be leaving my little babies, but sometimes there are really, uh, you know, amazing opportunities that require <laughs> travel. So I, I did, I did some travel, um, when they were very little. Um, and that was, um, yeah, I think, I think that's just a part of the job and, and was good. Um, but, um, it's definitely, it's, it's not, it's not an easy thing, but it's, 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 it's doable with everything else with marshalling, like the right help and support and family and friends. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this really gives hope to all other young women faculty members or the ones inspiring for the faculty membership. So to just to see that, okay, this can be done. You can, can be have, done. Yes. You can have a family <laughs> and you can have a successful career you have in it. So thank you for sharing. Um, and then one of the last questions I have, uh, over the years, how did you succeed towards a fully tenured position? So how did your thought process change and uh, how did you realize that, okay, this may be necessary for the success. I should you know, develop these skills or do these activities. So just mm -hmm. give us a brief overview of that. Yeah. Um, one thing our department does really well is um, they, you have a mentoring committee and, and um, that you meet with uh, at least once a year, sometimes, you know, more, you know, many more than once a year. Um, and they can help you think through all those different aspects. Um, and one of the, I remember one of the shifts I made was in starting on the faculty, um, I did a lot of exploring of projects to see like, you know, what would pay off? <laughs> like what, like what is, you know, you know, what, what can be done in this area? What can be done in that area? I wrote proposals on a number of different topics and I kind of saw which ones came through and then added a little more effort to some streams, um, you know, versus others. Um, and then uh, towards the end of tenure track, 
um, I was definitely much more focused on, okay, like that paper, that paper, that paper I want out because then that makes a complete story for this part of the work that I've done. And I kind of narrowed more, um, uh, it's a little different than the sort of exploration phase when I was sort of starting on the faculty. Um, and uh, in terms of like what opportunities are valuable uh, or less valuable, I have lots of opportunity to ask those of, you know, of what, what others thought about which ones, you know, if I can't do them all, like which ones are the you know, really most valuable ones um, to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there's, there, for me, there was definitely a shift. So as some things got easier and I knew how to write proposals and I knew how to do this and that and that, I then was you know, a little more focused um, in, in other ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, then any tips on how to stay resilient in this process? Like, for example, some like as a faculty member, let's say I have a very good idea, which I I'm very convinced and excited about. And let's say there is a bad phase and I'm not getting it accepted by a funding agency. So how to keep going? And I'm asking this to just because this happens a lot to many. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh no, you just you just totally have to be really persistent. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I love the peer, like I'm a, I'm a believer in the peer review process. I love the peer review process. So I don't, um, uh, I don't, I don't mind if I submit a proposal and it, you know, it doesn't get accepted in the first round, if I have valuable feedback on it, because it might be that it often is, I'm not expressing, uh, you know, some aspect of it or the novelty of it, or, you know, in some, in, in a way that someone else can see also. <laughs> so that feedback is like very valuable to me. I'm like, okay, now I know how to change it to try to, um, to try to improve it. And same thing with papers. So, um, you know, I, there's, um, there's a difference between being really excited and really believing in the work. And then, uh, which is not necessarily linked to it being accepted right away. Cause again, like, um, uh, your colleagues are smart people and they, they can often have ways to, you know, improve the paper or it needs to be reframed in a way so that it's, um, understood better. Um, and I, and I like that process. Every time we've had a paper that is not accepted the first go around or a proposal that isn't accepted, you know, the first go around when it is ultimately it's the, that's the version of the project that I want out in the world, or that's the version of the paper that I want out in the world. And so for me, that's, that's a part of the process, but I remember very, very well as a grad student where every, you know, every review back was, um, was, uh, you know, like a like um, it, I like it's easier to have that longer time frame after you've done it many times. Um, you know, I remember as a grad student, I'd read reviews and then I'd have to like put them down and come back the next day and read them again <laughs> to be able to you know be constructive with them. Um, but it's to me, it's just a part of the process. And there's you know, it doesn't it's not a signal on the quality of your work or like the amazingness of your ideas. It's useful feedback for being able to convey your quality work and your ideas uh, in, in their most impactful way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like you just take the best uh, of all the situations, even if it is rejected, you just see what were the comments, how can I make it better and proceed forward? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we are almost at the end of our interview. So in the end, I would request you to give a message to young women who are aspiring to have a long-term career in aerospace. Uh, and so what would you say, what skills or traits are, you would say that more most crucial to stay successful in this like long-term career? Yeah. Um... I think, you know, I think aerospace is just like such a booming and exciting industry right now. So first of all, good choice. <laughs> and, um, uh, and I think build, like building your. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, well, I'd say, first of all, like, you know, aerospace is a booming, a booming industry right now. It's a really, really exciting area. So great choice. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, I think the most like for um, I, you know, you could probably tell I am very much a glass half full kind of person and sort of a, you know, a, a positive attitude and meeting the challenges that you face um, with the same energy that you meet like technical challenges um, uh, is is a really valuable, um, you know, way to to approach uh, approach things. And um, 
uh, yeah, I'm super, super happy to do this with you because I think the more that we share with each other and the more we aim to, to help each other, just the easier it is for us and for, for those that, um, you know, we will train up and, and also help uh, send out in the world to do, to do great work. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. It's, it's been such a pleasure to, you know, learn from you and hear about all the journey, how it went and it gives us hope and it makes, I am sure that many women will learn from this and will keep pursuing their goals and they will not give up until they have reached all their goals. So yeah, thank well, it's, um, um, thank you so much for asking me to do it. It's like, an, it's an honor to be asked to be a part of your, you know, brand new series. Mm -hmm. 